Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of John Donne's selected poems. So today I'm going to be exploring The Ecstasy, a poem in which Dunn explores the concept of religious rapture, uh, something that's a consequence of the soul departing the body, allowing a contemplation of the divine or an appreciation of the world on a spiritual level. So if we take a look at the poem itself, it's a big one, so uh, take a deep breath. Where, like a pillow on a bed, a pregnant bank swelled up to rest, the violet's reclining head, sat we two, one another's best. Our hands were firmly cemented with a fast balm, which thence did spring. Our eye beams twisted and did thread our eyes upon one double string. So to intergraft our hands, as yet was all the means to make us one, and pictures in our eyes to get was all our propagation. As twixt two equal armies, fate suspends uncertain victory. Our souls, which to advance their state were gone out, hung twixt her and me. And whilst our souls negotiate there, we, like sepulchral statues, lay all day. The same our postures were, and we said nothing all the day. If any, so by love refined that he soul's language understood, and by good love were grown all mind, with inconvenient distance stood, he, though he knew not which soul spake, because both meant both spake the same, might thence a new concoction take, and part far purer than he came. This ecstasy doth unperplex, we said, and tell us what we love. We see by this it was not sex, we see we saw not what did move. But as all several souls contain mixture of things, they know not what, love, these mixed souls doth mix again, and makes both one, each this and that. A single violet transplant, the strength, the colour and the size, all which before was poor and scant, redoubles still and multiplies. When love, with one another so interanimates two souls, that abler soul, which then doth flow, defects of loneliness controls. We then, who are this new soul, know of what we are composed and made, for the atomies of which we grow are souls whom no change can invade. But, oh alas, so long, so far our bodies, why do we forbear? They are ours, though they are not we. We are the intelligences, they the spheres. We owe them thanks, because they thus did us to us at first convey, yielded their senses force to us, nor are just to us, but a lie. On man heaven's influence works not so, but that it first imprints the air, so soul into the soul may flow, though it to body first repair. As our blood labours to beget spirits as like souls as it can, because such fingers need to knit that subtle knot which makes us man, so must pure lovers' souls descend to affections and to faculties which sense may reach and apprehend, or else a great prince in prison lies. To our bodies turn we then, that so weak men on love revealed may look, love's mysteries in souls do grow, but yet the body is his book. And if some lover, such as we, have heard this dialogue of one, let him still mark us, he shall see small change when we are to bodies gone. So structurally, the poem is usually printed as a single stanza, but it's worth bearing in mind that some editions do divide it into quatrains. And um, in terms of understanding, it can be useful to think of it in terms of quatrains. Dunn begins the poem with the Petrarchan convention of lovers presented in a beautiful setting. Uh, we have this pillow of a bed. The initial simile could be suggestive of sex, given those references to things like pillow, pregnant, swelled and reclining head. However, the images could also suggest comfort, with the bank represented through the simile of a pillow that rises up in order to provide rest for the reclining head of the violet. And the violet itself is a flower that's traditionally associated with fidelity. And the action of it reclining its head is an action that's often representative of modesty. If you think of someone hanging their head because of coyness or shyness. And the image of a supportive and comforting nature seems to create a more appropriate tone, really, for the poem than that sexual interpretation, although we'll come to that later. Dunn conveys that the lovers are equal in status, although somewhat paradoxically, one another's best. Each believes the other to be the best thing for them. 
uh, the idea is that there's so much interconnectedness between them that uh, they can be equal despite believing the other party to be superior. And this paradox is complemented by that juxtaposition of two, one, creating a sense of their interconnectedness once again. That interconnection of the lovers is represented in the images found in the next quatrain. Uh, we have this idea of their hands being cemented, conveying the solidity of their union. And that's reinforced again by the adverb firmly. The fast balm that joins them could be a reference to sweat. I know it doesn't sound very romantic, but um, it is a natural substance uh, from each of their bodies that's becoming mingled, symbolising their union. And the link to nature could be maintained by a potential pun on the word spring. It could be used to represent the swift creation of the balm from its source, that it springs from their hands. But it, of course, also denotes a spring of water, not the waterfall that I've got here, but uh, you know what I mean, uh, linking it to the river that the uh, lovers are presented as sitting beside. Um, it's important to notice that Elizabethans believed that sweat had preservative qualities, uh, perhaps preventing or helping to prevent the bodies from decaying once the uh, souls depart. So Dunn moves from the sense of touch to the sense of sight, again reinforcing this sense of the interconnectedness of the lovers. Elizabethans believed that sight was achieved by beams of light being sent from an eye to an object, uh, hence the image of Cyclops, or from the object to the eye. Um, so we see things by receiving this beam of light sent by an object. And Dunn's image here presents the concepts of those eye beams being directed at each of the lovers as they stare into one another's eyes. They're so connected that the beams of light emanating from their eyes become twisted together, bound into one, just as he presents the lovers as being bound together to one. The duality of their existence is, existence is evident in their eyes functioning on this one double string, a string that's been bound together. He also uses uh, horticultural imagery to complement both the pastoral scene and this sense of interconnectedness. He uses language from the semantic field of horticultural propagation to convey the nature of the connection, an image that refers to, returns to later in the poem. So we've got the word intergraft, uh, which relates to grafting, the process of fusing parts of plants so that they can grow together, and propagation, which is the process of growing new plants. And that horticultural conceit is employed in order to reveal the nature of the lover's relationship. The holding of hands, which they're doing as they sit opposite each other, are, grafts their bodies together, like the plant being grafted to another plant. Um, it's the only way, however, in which their bodies have been joined, all the means to make as one. So we're getting a sense of the platonic nature of their relationship. Similarly, their only propagation are the pictures in our eyes. Uh, the image is one that's similar to that in The Good Morrow, where the physical proximity of the lovers allows them to create the image of themselves in the other's eyes, hence the kind of duplication of the self. But this is the only form of propagation. There's no sexual propagation that would lead to a child being produced. It's merely their image. So the souls are represented as having left the bodies at this stage and are suspended between them in a kind of state of limbo. And that simile of the equal armies conveys the equalities of the lovers' souls. Battle imagery is a fairly conventional means of representing sex, but here the physical is abandoned. It's the souls that are negotiating for the armies. The balance of the souls is Dunn's primary concern. And Dunn extends that battle conceit by representing the souls as the negotiators between the two opposing forces. It's interesting that the poetic voice identifies the lovers more profoundly, however, with the physical rather than the spiritual at this stage. While the souls negotiate, he states that we lay and we said nothing. So we seems to be referring to the bodies. The souls are divorced from this sense of identity. 
The lovers trust their souls to negotiate the terms associated with their love. And the simile of the sepulchral statues represents, pretty hyperbolically, their physical inaction as they adopt the same position all the day. So we're left with this image of these kind of physical carcasses that um, are sitting staring at one another while the souls negotiate. And it's this negotiation that's going to dominate the rest of the poem. Um, so I hope I'll see you for the second part. Take care. Cheers.